Hello, welcome back to All Few Night WFC. We're, what are we, three days away now from the Women's World Cup starting? It's finally here, the World Cup week. We've got another player, United player, to talk about. So we covered the Lionesses last week. Um, so we've got only the one representative from Norway, even though we do have three Norwegians at United, but we've only got the one rep uh, to talk about. Well, we're going to talk about Ireland to start with. We're going to start off with them, because obviously, as people can see, obviously Phil is, is back with us. So it would be rude not to talk about Ireland. And we do have an Irish player now. Um, in obviously for Mannion, albeit not going to the World Cup, unfortunately. But we've got to talk about Ireland and the, and the success story of that. And we're going to obviously talk about Norway and what happened last summer and obviously the improvements going into this World Cup. And obviously we've got Vilda to talk about and and, and Lisa, Maria and, and all those kinds of things. And we will talk a little bit towards the end about some other World cup stuff as well. So we've got so much to cover over the next kind of just under an hour or however long this goes on for. Um, firstly, Jess, Phil, oh, she's gone. That, that, was, that was a great start. I don't know why she's just clicked there. <laughs> But you're on mute as well, Phil. So this is a you might want to unmute yourself first. Can you find the um there we go? Yeah, yeah. I was just gonna say thanks to Jess for being with us for the first 90 seconds of the show. <laughs> Stellar contribution as always. But uh let's move on. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't know what's happened there. I don't know whether um, oh she's just met it, her laptop has just died, so she'll be back in, in just, just a second. <laughs> But Let's Phil, say loads of libelous things about her before she gets here. Then. <laughs> <laughs> what did she say before we went live? She's just going to wing it today. Um, <laughs> it's, that's that's, that's going well. <laughs> <laughs> that works out well from the start. Um, right, I may as well just ask you from the off. Then, obviously, we will start with Ireland. We'll talk about Norway in the in the kind of second half. But yeah, how are you feeling about Ireland going into this one? Because it's it's a good it's a big story for them. There's a lot of obviously first time uh, World Cup participants in that obviously the Irish fans are really happy and and everything else but yeah how are you uh how are you feeling about Ireland going into this one I, I think it's brilliant on many levels Connor because like it is as you say the first major finals for the women and the men qualify for the World Cup for the first time in 1990 and that changed not just football but it also changed all of Ireland because all of Ireland all of a sudden we instead of being you know this third world backwater on the edge of Europe we started to see ourselves as being as good and being able to compete with everybody else now qualifying for the Euros uh, two years previously in 1988 that was one thing and it was indeed a harder tournament because it was only like you know eight teams in it at that point but for the women to do this now, it was so important because, as we said many times at this show, the women's game is developing so quickly that if you don't get on this train now, it's leaving the station and it's going to leave without you, right? And that's where, you know, the Scandinavian clubs, or sorry, Scandinavian countries sliding down just a little bit. Uh, that's been one thing in recent years, and it could leave them behind. Denmark have struggled. They haven't been there since 2009. But for Ireland to get in there is an absolutely brilliant thing. And we're seeing some, uh, some Ireland fans in there saying, go on, Ireland, already. Um, when we look at Aoife Mannion and Manchester United and that kind of thing, right? Aoife would have been in this squad if she was fit. The moment we saw her get that injury, the clock started ticking. And unfortunately, Aoife couldn't beat it. And it was so unfortunate because I've heard from within the camp that her and Sinead Farrelly, who has come in uh, from the NWSL, they have raised the quality of footballer in that squad immeasurably, right? Because you have... Uh, really good players have really solid players. But what they were looking, what they were lacking really is that next level. You have Katie McCabe, you have Denise Sullivan, two tremendous players. But to have an Aoife Mannion there to bolster things would have made a huge difference. Sinead Farley, who's come in, watch out now on Thursday at 11 a.m. when they kick off against Australia. Sinead is not 100% fit, right? She's maybe 60, 70 minutes in her. But I have nicknamed her the Matrix because when she gets the ball, the, everything just slows down, right? It looks like she's playing a completely different game to everybody else. Everybody freezes. She picks a pass, and it's the most dangerous option on the field for the opponent. So she's going to be really, really good. Now, we don't know where they are. They're playing the host nation. Australia are very, very good. Gave France a very, very tight game. They've been preparing for this for, for years, not just for you know the, this World Cup cycle. You have Canada, who are the Olympic champions, and a tremendously good team defensively. Don't score many goals, but they don't have to. And then you have Nigeria, who are the best historically the best team in Africa, men or women. Right. So that's a huge ask. But what that does, Connor, is it removes 
all pressure from Ireland, right? They literally just have to show up. They've already won just by being there. They've done a great thing for Irish football just to qualify for that. So by showing up now, there's no pressure on them on Thursday at all. And the longer the game goes on against Australia and they can keep it to nil-nil or maybe even keep it to just one-nil during that game, they will always believe that they had to have a chance, right? Now, the one thing I would say that we're lacking, or not lacking as such, but it's hard to see where Ireland's goals are going to come from if it's not the head of Louise Quinn at a set piece, formula, uh, former WSL winner with Arsenal, of course, really good player for Birmingham City, really solid defender. But when your game plan, a bit like Canada, when your game plan is set pieces and that kind of thing, it's not enough at this level, right? You have to have a creative player, standout finisher. Amber Barrett, who scored the goal against Scotland that caused you to weep such bitter tears in the playoff, Connor. Uh, she's a tremendous finisher as well, but she's had a tough season at Turbina Potsdam, and now she signed for Standard Liège. She hasn't played that much during the season. So there's a lot of question marks over Ireland, but I would say that, you know, Ireland's success at the World Cup came in qualifying for it, and everything else now is just a bonus. But I would love to see the Irish team go out there and be brave, right? I do not care about results and I haven't cared about results with any team for a long time right it's go out there and show me who you are right when I take off this white t-shirt and put on a green jersey make me proud that you wear that and that I wear that right go out and give these I don't care if you're not good enough right but go out there and make me proud of the effort that you put in and I think that's a feeling that an awful lot of Irish fans share we're not happy just to take part right we're not happy just to be there and to provide the opposition for Australia in front of 80 odd thousand people right go out there and give a good account to yourself give them a give them a game right and show the kids back home boys and girls men and women that this is what it's all about i thought you were gonna go <clears throat> gonna go full conor mcgregor then with you we're not here to take part we're here to take over or whatever he's been stealing my lines for years that guy <laughs> um jess welcome back i hope you you're with us and <laughs> You can hear uh, us and speak. Barely, yes. I, uh, I don't know what's happened to my laptop. It is now back up, so I might duck out again and rejoin back on my laptop. Uh, it's really going well for me today. I think I'm feeling like, you know, there's kind of like bad Monday blues. Like nothing's <laughs> really worked today. Um, so it's just continuing into my evening. So that's that's fine. But yeah, I did I did catch most of that. Um, I think I'd like to see Ireland do well, to be fair. I'd like to see them, I don't know, just get a few goals, hopefully. I was, going to say, uh, I was going to ask you actually, Joe, and just a little talking point what, what, off the back of what Phil was saying. I mean, obviously, it's it's got him for us, isn't it? That that Mannion's not made it because I think oh, certainly after yeah. the performances at the back end of the season, it's like that would have almost been a a, a, a real good like almost redemption, not redemption arc, because obviously you're injured, but like recovery arc if you want to call it that. Obviously, the long term injury comes back to fantastic performance against Arsenal, and then to make it to the World Cup, it would have been so good for him, wouldn't it? And it, obviously, as a United fan, oh, 100 percent. It's just it's so unlucky. Um, you never really want to see any player get injured, but especially kind of a player from your own team and a player who's kind of, this might be sort of one of her only shots of being at a tournament like that. Um, and, you know, it's not like it. I know it's kind of a bit of a reoccurrence of, a, of an old injury, but she had sort of come back from that. Um, so it's sad, you know, it's really kind of gut-wrenching that she'd almost, almost like she was so close to kind of being back in the squad, obviously switched kind of from England to Ireland and just didn't quite make it in the end. It's, uh, yeah, it must be absolutely gutting for her. I think it's gutting for, for Ireland as well, Connor, because he was one of those players. When you bring her in, the quality that she brings in as well. And it's also, Jess just touched on something very interesting there, right? Of her doing the reverse Declan Rice, as it's now known in the business, of going from England to Ireland and that. And we've always had long discussions about this, going back to when, you know, Jack Charlton took over the men's team and he was bringing in players uh, who had, you know, basically people who were born in England to Irish parents and that kind of thing. And I've spoken for many years about this idea of nationality and of, you know, who you feel that you are, right? Jack Grealish has done it. Declan Rice has done it. And it's fascinating now to see that whole thing happen in the women's game as well. Sinead Farrelly was born and raised in America. You know, but, you know, Aoife Manuel, the same thing, born and raised in England. But it's not up to me to tell them that they're English or that they're Irish. I say to my own children who are born and raised in Sweden that they're not half Swedish and half Irish. They are both Swedish and Irish. And to have that opportunity then Chuck and Nicolini is <laughs> giving us a little bit of the girls in green there. She's looking forward to them. Um, but yeah, to have that option then of representing two countries, because it's also that, you know, oh, which do you prefer? That depends as well. It depends on the opportunity that you're offered. And, you know, in the end of the day, I think if you look at Aoife Mannion as a person, as a footballer, mm -hmm. did she deserve the chance to play at the World Cup? The answer is yes. 
And the Irish backroom team did absolutely everything they could in conjunction with Man United to get her ready for that. And unfortunately, it wasn't to, to be. But I'd love to see us move away. And I'm the worst in the world as well. As well. Like, you'll see me on Twitter having to go at Declan Rice left, right and centre just because it's so much fun, right? But I do think that we have to be open to the idea that players can play for more than one country or that even that fans... Like, I mean, Connor, you have roots in Scotland. You have roots in Ireland as well, as far as I know, right? But to be able to say, OK, well, maybe, you know, it's England this day, it's Ireland... The, the other day, which is, you know, it's absolutely not done in footballing circles. But I think we have to be open to that because there has to be tribalism, there has to be rivalry, but there also has to be a grey area there for people to move around in, from feeling Irish one day to feeling English. Not like Infantino now, where he feels like a migrant worker, all right? We're not accepting that, not to that extent. But I do think, especially in the Women's World Cup, because the culture of the game is so different and it's so much more about inclusion that there has to be space for an Aoife Mannion to be celebrated, and indeed to be missed now when she's not going to make it to the tournament and play in that green jersey. Oh, go on, Jess. <laughs> no, I was going to say 100%. I think um, at the end of the day, she probably wasn't going to make it into the England squad, so I don't know how. You can't really kind of begrudge her from sort of switching to Ireland. Um, like you say, you want you want a player like that to kind of be able to play international football at a good level. Um, and at the end of the day, this is what every single player will dream of. You know, the World Cup is kind of the one, the one thing that every player is going to grow up wanting to go to. So yeah, it's a huge opportunity for her, and it's uh, it's good that she's missed it. But I think she did the right thing in switching from um, uh, England to Ireland, to be honest, because it gave it gave her an opportunity. You know, it gave her the chance to be there. It just it's unlucky that she got injured. Yeah, that's exactly. It. Obviously, from a United point of view, I'm glad that she's. Uh that she's going to be fit and ready for, for next season. But that's something I will come back to actually talk about, see, you know, moving forward. But I kind of, I guess, before we look at, at Norway and so on, another question, I guess, f- from an Ireland point of view, you mentioned about the results don't necessarily matter and things like that. Ellie, I think, asked the question a little bit further up. Can Ireland get any points in that? You mentioned the group that they're in. Do you think that there's potential Ireland can get a point, a, a win, or even could they get out of that group? Could they potentially topple? I don't think it, Canada, I think, is going to be the one, if any, if they scrape through, I don't think Australia are going to drop any, but could could they cause an upset? Or what, how are you kind of feeling points-wise that they could get to? This is the group of death, right? And, and absolutely anything could happen, right? Because... It's no mistake, or is it like it's no coincidence that people call Ireland the fighting Irish, right? They're, they will go out there and they will give absolutely everything. They could be 4 0 down to Australia after half an hour and they still will not give up, right? And that is a huge, huge bonus. Remember, Canada don't score a whole lot of goals, right? Uh, Nigeria were undone at the last World Cup on set pieces, which so, uh, is something that Ireland were absolutely brilliant at. And if you watch Ireland's pre World Cup friendlies, you saw nothing of what they're going to do there against France, right? They went up there and they just to hoof their corners in that it didn't even bother because they're keeping all this secret just to use them against teams like Nigeria and against Canada, right? They could come back with no points, conceding 10 goals, not having scored a single goal, or they could top the group, right? It all depends on how well they execute the game plan. They will have to play, in my estimation, they'll have to play three completely different games, right? One, in the first game, Australia's going to dominate the ball, Ireland's going to have to counter-attack, and that's where Denise O'Sullivan comes in and Sinead Farley comes in because they can open up a team on the counter with one ball and then it's going to be up to Kira Carusa or Katie McCabe or whoever's ahead of them to put that ball in the back of the net they might get two or three chances they're going to have to score one or two of them if they want to win the game right Canada is going to be two teams that don't want the ball it's going to be like watching two Jose Mourinho sides right because both teams would like to counter somebody's going to have to do something again it's going to be McCabe or Sullivan Farley who are going to have to open that up right and then the last game against Nigeria that all depends on what the previous results are right if the pressure is off Ireland if they've lost those two games they'll just go all out they like they don't care. As I say, it's like it's it's a case of either come home with your shield or on it. That's it. You know, we're not going to accept any more of that. And they know what those expectations are. But I think that this this team and this squad and this manager are going out there, not with the idea of just being part of a World Cup or maybe even getting out of the World Cup, right? The legacy of this World Cup is going to be the, the, the inspiration, how much they can inspire the next generation of footballers, right? Because there's so much to be won there, right? These girls are already historic, but they can go from historic to immortal if they beat Australia on Thursday, right? And if they were to beat Canada as well and make it to the last 16, can you imagine... Ireland playing England in the last 16 of the Women's World Cup in the year of our Lord, 2023. Lads, close every business in the islands. Forget it. 
right? This is going to be the biggest thing that's happened in the 21st century if that happens. And that's the kind of thing that Ireland need to aim at, okay? Zoom out, see the bigger picture and go there. And their, their hashtag, if you like, or their motto, according to the Sky Deal that they have, is out believe. And I think some marketing mug came up with that, right? But what I choose to believe that that, that means is do the things you cannot even dream are possible, right? Because that's what this is. This is not about what's probable or, you know, I know there's a comment coming up there about Canada and the amount of troubles that they have and everything else like that. All of that has to be put to one side. Ireland had their same troubles. Was it 2017 that they held a press conference uh, in the centre of Dublin and talked about how they had to change it to tracksuits borrowed from the boys under 19 team uh, in the airport toilets, right? What was it? Six years later and this is where we are now. We have to believe that this is possible. And I don't think that, you know, ultimately it's not just Irish fans who will be inspired by this, but if they were to meet in England in the last 16 or in the quarterfinals, I think English fans would be inspired by it and fans all over the globe would be inspired by that and that to me would be the great victory for Ireland at the World Cup Honestly Phil, you could convince me of anything Could I just say, right. nobody is to place any bets whatsoever based on anything I say ever Have we that out of the way? I'm actually this... supporting I, I, Ireland, like, seriously your, your jersey's in the post Jess, I'll pay for it <laughs> Thank you, thank you <laughs> Honestly, it's we're going to get on to obviously Norway in a second, but this is what happened last summer. I, I really believe the Norway hype, and obviously we know how that went in, in the end. But uh, that's something we will uh, we'll talk about in just a second. Paul makes a really good point. I didn't even think of it like that. McCabe obviously versus our own uh, Jade Riviere on that on that right hand side. Something that we're probably going to well we will see in next season because Jade is likely to be our starting right back. So we're going to see that battle in WSL. So good practice for her, for for Jade on that. On that right hand side up against McCabe, you're not going to get more of a physical battle than <laughs> than against her. Though. <laughs> no, it'll be interesting to see that actually. It might be a good sort of precursor for uh, for the season. <laughs> I know. I didn't, I didn't even think of it like that. To be fair, and uh, what's the other one? Here? Yeah, oh, <laughs> of course you will, Alex. Yeah, got to got to be done. Got to be done. Should. Uh, should I think progress? That's for sure. I really don't know on that one. Um, I'm going to come back to to Man in just a little second. Oh, that was good. Tagged or something. I need to have a look. <laughs> um, so Norway. Then we'll move on, obviously, to the to the main bulk. Obviously, Vilda's on the thumbnail. We'll come back to Vilda specifically in a second. I just want to ask you straight off the bat in terms of the feeling in and around Norway. I know you've you obviously speak to a lot of people in and around in, you know, the Norwegian squad and the setup and, and so on. But what's the feeling going into this tournament? Because obviously, we know what happened last summer. They've they've had some okay results. You know, in in kind of the, the the games leading up, obviously the Sweden three three, I believe it was back in April. I'm going to say it was yep. some time back then. So there's been some some decent ish results. But what have you kind of made of them, and and what can they do in this tournament? Because it's there's such a, a mixed bag. I mean, ability wise, you are looking at the players, it's it's an incredibly stacked attacking squad anyway. But what what's your kind of feeling of of them going into this tournament? Well, I don't think we can talk about this tournament as a World Cup in 2023 without going over the corpse of the Euros last year and doing one final post-mortem on that, right? And this is one of those things that's taken a long time for the full story of this, of, of the disaster that happened last year to come out. And basically what it has come down to when you speak to people in Norwegian football, some of whom I will name, others will remain nameless, right? But the whole thing was a tactical disaster. And in that 45 minutes of the first half against England, it was just laid bare, right? You had Yuli Blackstaff from Manchester City across the other side of the city from you guys there uh, put in at left back, a brilliant footballer almost destroyed her career because she's no left back and indeed Connor, I think I told you the story of meeting her dad before the Austria game and if he had gotten his hands on the coach Martin Kroegren at that point, I don't know if Mr Kroegren would have gotten out of there alive you know? but since then, it's not just that's not just the opinion of journalists and that that's the opinion of players that I've spoken to in great detail about this as well that they felt that so much went wrong tactically and that's not going to happen this time around Right. So British viewers will be familiar with Hegedisa because she took uh, the, the Great Britain team. I think it was that Phil Neville was supposed to take it and then he took a job somewhere else and she came in and she did OK. Hege Reese's strong point now is, and again, when I mentioned I don't care about results, I don't think she cared too much about results either. She's trying to get a team bedded down in terms of offensive and defensive principles to get ready for this tournament. So the friendies, 3-3 against Sweden, she's not going to be that b- bothered about that. Frida Mollen scoring a hat-trick, great. But what did they learn? What are they going to do this summer when they get down there? She has the huge benefit of, in the 2019 squad, 
Uh, at that time, she was coaching LSK, uh, the women's team there, who had just won the double. Gura Leighton was just about to leave that team to go to Chelsea. Higginisa had coached six members of that squad that went to the 2019 World Cup in that LSK team. Uh, English Sustad Engen was one. Therese Sessi Orsland was another. The, uh, Emily Horvey was there. Like, There's a whole bunch of players who are still in the national team today. Uh, of the four I mentioned, only Orsland isn't in the squad for, the, for this year's tournament as well. Right? She knows who these players are. These players trust her. For those who don't know Higginisa, as a player, she won the World Cup in 1995, right? So this isn't some Swedish blow-in from across the border who's coming in to tell them what to do. This is the DNA of Norwegian football is now running the show, right? And when I spoke to people, like this week, I spoke to Ada Hegebe earlier on in the week. They did a Teams meeting for journalists who were left back home here in Scandinavia. And um, my thoughts on the media not sending me to Australia and New Zealand, but we'll leave them out of this conversation because that would be a rant that you wouldn't be able to publish. But um, when I spoke to Ada about what they can do better, because if you remember last year, Year. They scored four against Northern Ireland, right, in a 4 1 victory in their first game, then didn't score after that. Not only that, they didn't even look like scoring after that, right? And that was very much because they had Caroline Graham Hansen on one wing, you had Gula Leighton on the other wing, you had Ada Hegebe in the middle, and somehow it was left to them to decide okay, once we get the ball over the half line, halfway line, you just freestyle it, just do what you're doing, kind of thing, right? Now, obviously, they had match plans, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but that was the sort of the impression that the players gave me that they felt that, you know, their defensive principles were worked on much more and their offensive principles weren't worked on at all. Their defensive principles appeared to be wrong <laughs> and their offense was just non existent, you know. Now, I believe that Matt De- Again, uh, had a great support in Caroline Graham Hansen. She liked him. I think it's because she was given an awful lot of freedom on that right hand side. But as we've subsequently found out, Carol sort of retired from the national team after that tournament. After Hagen got the job, she said, Look, I'm taking a break. I'm tired. I have so many injuries. I just need time to get my body and my mind right again. And she was right to do that. But that would suggest to me that she wasn't really right during that tournament last year, physically or mentally. And I do think that it took a toll on her because I've mentioned on this show before, she's one of life's great winners and even a bigger winner than hers on the Hegebay and she was not happy with what happened last year so I do believe that this time around they have a much more solid defense right so Mara Mielda last year was coming off a horrific injury and she'd only played a couple of games at Chelsea and now all of a sudden she's starting against England Maria Torres thought that I'm sorry but Martin Kroegren almost destroyed her by leaving her so exposed in that first half against England because Mara wasn't fit and Maria had to go and deal with everything and I think that that was deeply unfair tactically to do that to her but I think that this year now, for, like, you have a, a left-footed left-back, which is tremendous. Somebody who's actually played in the position before. Because historically for Norway, they haven't really produced that many. They tend to be left-wingers rather than left-backs. But now you actually have in uh, Maude Blatter, uh, Lund. She's got to play at left-back. And she she's comfortable in the position. She knows her positioning. She knows how to stay in the line, which is what England exposed when Yuli Blackstab tried to play there. So I do think that... They've also had a very fortuitous draw, right? So they're playing New Zealand, who are host nations, but wouldn't have much hope. I don't think they've won any of their 15 games of the World Cup before now, and I can't see them starting, certainly not against Norway, when those two teams play now at whatever it is, 8 o'clock uh, British time on Thursday morning. Uh, then they have Switzerland, who are a good team, but they're also at the World Cup for the first time. And then you have Philippines, who are there for the first time. And I think they were hammered by Sweden 5-1 yesterday in a behind-closed-doors friendly. Stina Blackstenius, the Arsenal striker, got a hat-trick. So th- that that's going to make it easy for Norway to get out of the group. Now, I can't remember. You might look it up for me, Connor. who they'll face if they get out of there. I think it might be Spain. It might be somebody like that, right? So, But it's teed up for Norway's revenge, right? And if there's one thing that those girls in red are going to be wanting for this tournament, um, I think I told you again, um, when uh, England beat them, uh, whatever it was, 8-0 last year in Brighton, and I was in the tunnel. So my job last year for UEFA was I was working as the interviewer for the Flash Zone, right? So I would have to go and ask Martin Huelgren, what on earth were you thinking playing Yuli Blackstad left back? This kind of thing, right? But after the England game, I was looking down the tunnel. So I wasn't allowed to walk through the tunnel, but I was looking down the tunnel. And they said to me, who do you want to speak to? And I said, well, I have to speak to Huelgren. He's the coach. I need to know what happened there. I'd like to speak to Mara Mielda, the captain. Uh, and then if Arda wants to talk to me, I'll talk to Arda. So about, you know, it's probably maybe 40 meters from where the players come in to where I was standing with my microphone and all this quite tall and I'm quite tall and she's looking over the heads of everybody and she's pointing to me and then she's pointing to where the flash room is because we've done an interview before the game and pretty much she was saying, I'll see you in there. I was going, okay. This is not good, okay? If she wants to talk to me now, most players will go and hide. And she came out and she went, this is not who we are. We need to show the world that this is not who we are. And then they came out, of course, they were pretty flat against Austria as well. But their goose was cooked at that stage. But I think that that's 
sensation hasn't left the older players. The girls who were in that squad last year, uh, they are going to want to prove that that was an anomaly, that they are as good as England, that they can put it up to the top sides in the world. And part of that is going to be going out there and performing and sticking to the game plan that they have. And this time around, it's a comprehensive game plan rather than just saying, OK, these are the four backs. The left back has never really played there before. And you three up front could just freestyle and I'll see it when the game's over. Quickly, just before you jump in, I did just <clears throat> double check it. Yeah, they will play uh, Spain, Costa Rica, Zambia or Japan. Providing they top the group, it will be whoever's second in in that group. They play uh, Group C, so yeah, anyone in that one, whoever finishes second. Providing Norway top it. Sorry, yes, Karen. <laughs> I just wants to <laughs> confirm that one. Well, I think I'm a Norway fan now, actually, so forget Ireland. Uh, you fully Again, got me... No bets, Jess, no bets. <laughs> you fully got me hyped about Norway. No, I mean, it does sound very much like they've kind of fixed the issues that were, that, that were sort of present last year. Um, I mean, everyone kind of knows how good Norway can be. It... it, it was sort of one of those games that was so strange you can only kind of rule it out as a bit of sort of an, an anomaly like you said what would you say would be like a successful tournament then for Norway this season like what kind of would they be hoping for after kind of such a sort of damp, damp squib last year do you know what, Jess? It's a brilliant question because last year, Martin Hörgren, the Swedish coach, came out in the media before the tournament in England and he said, the, Swe or the Swedes and Norwegians refer to it as winning a medal, right? So that means coming in the top three, right? And that's that's a pretty high bar, but he was going, no, no, we have to win a medal. We have to get in the, so the top three, the top four here, right? And this time around, it's the exact opposite. They're going, get out of the group. I think getting out of the group would be good. And so they're sort of trying to manage expectations in a different way now. I think they realize this year. Now, I would wager that this year's squad is a lot stronger than what they had last year, simply because, yeah, they have a left back, uh, they could play left back. But that idea of saying, okay, let's just get out of the group. And I, again, I uh, I spoke, to, was it God I talked to about this the other day? And I was saying, oh, yeah, I was asking her, how will you deal with change? Because like, you're, you're playing against lower ranked teams your first three games, but then you're going to come up against a Spain, you could meet the USA in the quarterfinals so you're going to have to change from being in possession all the time to being without the ball right will you be able to do that and this is the thing and you know she got me she went look i'm not talking about anything but the group stage this stage i'm not talking about anything you're not going to draw me out on that how we're going to play no we just have to get through this group first and i love it when she speaks like this i've said it before and she knows i've said this about her the two biggest winners i have ever met in my life are Kobe Bryant, the former LA Lakers basketball player, and Otto Hegebay. She hates losing, right? The idea that she could leave that tournament last year without scoring after the absolute rubbish that Norway put in against England and against Austria and try and go off and have some sort of a summer, it wouldn't surprise me if she hasn't slept since, lads. And that's a, that's a year ago, you know, because she wants to go. It doesn't matter what you do with Leon because Leon is expected to win everything. They're expected to win the French League and to do well in the Champions League. None of that matters. She came back to win. She she didn't come back, you know, like McGregor said, to take part. She came back because she wanted to win these things. She grew up with a generation. Lisa Klovnas, who's now president of the Norwegian Football Federation, was a major part in convincing Arda to come back and play last year, right, since she was elected. These women were winners. They made the final in 2013 of the European Championships when uh, Arda Hegeberg was, was playing. Karlene Grom Hansen played. Maude Mjelde played as a very young player there as well and played a big role. And they lost the final to Germany here, not far from where I'm sitting at the Friends Arena. That's that's who these women are, right? They are not the team that lost the 8-0 to uh, to England in Brighton, right? And they they know that, I know that, but they need the rest of the world to know that, right? And it doesn't matter how many times I say it, they got to go out there and show people that that's who they are. So by getting through that group now, I would honestly feel terrible for New Zealand in meeting these girls in the first mm -hmm. game because I honestly think that the front six that Norway can put out there at the moment... Reiten, Grom, Hansen, Hegeberg in front, right? You free them on them there. You have uh, Ingrid Sjöstad Engen there. And you have a Vilde Boerisa there that you can fit in somewhere as well. They could absolutely murder any team. Sophie Roman Hogg, who's playing for Roma and doing brilliantly. I think she scored against Portugal uh, in the behind closed doors game on Sunday night. You have Emily Horvey, who was, I think she was the player of the year in Serie A last year as Roma won last year. So you're talking about serious, serious footballers who've taken huge steps, not just since the last World Cup, but since last summer. And they are out to prove a point. Uh, I was going to ask you, actually, moving it kind of on. You met, as Jess just said, you convinced convince me of Norway's. Uh, I was just having a look there. So, obviously, you know, you mentioned the, the route that they could have. So, they should, obviously, as we said, top the group, the round of 16. You'd expect them, if they're going to play a second place team, it's likely Costa Rica, Zambia, or Japan. I'd expect them to get through that. Then, obviously, if they face USA in the quarters, 
I think that's probably where their journey ends, <laughs> looking at the USA squad. But I don't think that's a bad tour. If they can get to the quarterfinals, put in a good show against the US, I think that's that would be cons from, considering from where they were 12 months ago. Let, let, let me interrupt you there, Connor, right? Because okay. that is exactly <laughs> the kind of game that Arda is going to be ringing in in our calendar, right? She's going to be ringing in that quarterfinal. And not only that, she's going to be hoping to get the USA. Because how do you come back from losing 8-0 to England and the national shame of doing so? You go and you beat the USA or you run them, you put them to the pin of their collar in a World Cup quarterfinal and say, okay, this, this is who we are. Never mention the other thing again. This is who this team is. And that to me is where the redemption could come. I think just make it as far as the quarterfinals this time, uh, it's a, it would be a big thing for them. You know, if they meet the USA, fantastic. If they lose, fantastic. But if they were to beat them then, I think all of a sudden that's going to change the perspective. Because let's remember that these are one of the superpowers of women's football. They're one of very few nations to actually win the World Cup. Who's it? The US, Germany, Japan, and Norway. Norway won back in 1995, right? They're one of, I think, only nine teams that have been to every women's World Cup that has been ever have ever been played right this is something that you know it's not like cross-country skiing where they just show up and win all the medals right but this is their thing especially in terms of, of female sport over there so there is an expectation there and there is a sort of almost a demand that they put that right and i think that that is one of those things that they will look at and i think players like guru right and Guru's a fantastic kid, and she has learned so much at chelsea and she's also a winner right caroline graham hansen is also I've, I've never seen anybody as bitter after they lose as she is. And she usually turns it in herself and, and the way that she hasn't done enough that she could have done more, you know? And these are people who really will go all in to win. We have to remember the amount that Frida Monham has developed just in the last season alone at Arsenal, right? Frida would have been, you know, one of those players who you go, okay, there was three central midfielders. There was English Suis Tadengen, who's, you know, in and out of the team of Barcelona. There was Frida and Vilda Boerisa. I would say the first name on the team sheet now, centrally and certainly in central midfield, is Frida Monham. Frida Freedom on them is unbelievably key to what they're going to do. And I hate to say it because it's a, a rival of Manchester United now in the, in the Women's Super League. But she is probably, if not the best, she's one of the best midfielders in that league. And she's not the kind of person who suffers from nerves. She doesn't care about, you know, so many people in the stands or, oh, this is the Americans in front of me. When they needed goals against Sweden, she just kept scoring them until the whistle, final whistle went, you know. And then she came off and embraced everybody and off they went. I think her and Stina Blackstenius had a nice hug in the tunnel afterwards. And that. So I do think that this is something that, you know, I wouldn't, we always look at the World Cup because the USA wins it so often. You know, it's like saying the men's game, you know, it's, you play for 120 minutes and then Germany win on penalties. You know, you look at the US and you think they will always find a way. And they are immensely talented and they're absolutely the team to beat in, the, in this but I would say the Hager Riese is kind of comparable uh, to Wiegmann for England in terms of this woman knows the game inside and out there's nothing that can surprise her and it's just a case of whether she can find the right game plan and do the right things at the right time I was talking to today Ceci Ostland who isn't in the squad now uh, I met her a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this and she was saying how one of the things she learned uh, in the time that she worked with Hager was how to break the match up into digestible portions right we want to get through the first 10 minutes the first 15 minutes then we want to change then we want to do this then we want to do this and there was milestones all along the way that like mental triggers for the players they say okay clear the first corner just get it outside your own box ah check okay we've done that next thing get your own set piece work your own free kick work your own corner keeper comes and claims the first one all of these things that build a team during a game so you know it's like that old thing of how do you eat an elephant you do it one bite at a time and if the elephant is usa you might have to take a lot of bites in it but hagen Risi will come up with a way of eating that elephant <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty sure you said that in a you did you said that in a group chat once. I knew what as you were saying that, I was like, I've heard this phrase before. <laughs> and it was, it was it was from you. <laughs> So, so just it's, just so that everybody who, who's watching this knows, Connor usually interviews me for months beforehand before he has me on the chat, and then I just repeat what we say on WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. That's how we plan these shows. Um obviously you mentioned uh, the midfield there. Um it, I mean Jess, I'll throw it over to yourself first and then Phil just follow in on this. So we Obviously, Vilda Borisa is our, our Norway rep. Obviously, no Lisa or, or Maria, uh, unfortunately, for, for both of those. But how would you kind of look at, at Vilda, I guess, his influence on the squad? Phil's mentioned in the midfield that <laughs> Norway have. Do you see her starting at all? Because, I mean, is she better than Marnham? Probably, I, mean, oh, I, I hate saying it, probably not. Obviously, Engen's in there as well. Um, yeah, I think it's difficult, uh, especially with kind of her lack of game time, maybe at United. <laughs> Um, it's hard to know whether sort of national team managers are going to want to uh, take the risk almost on such a big stage. I mean, there's kind of no doubt their talents, um, 
But yeah, I think it maybe maybe a bit of a squad rotation play, you know, if um if if Norway kind of smashing it, uh beating a team quite comfortably, she's the sort of player that maybe they could bring on, um, to kind of see a game out, uh, help rest some of the other bigger players. But yeah, it's kind of hard to know where she's gonna fit into that squad because they're actually pretty stacked to be honest. I've never really kind of considered all the players they have, but like I say, I'm basically now Norway's biggest fan after everything Phil said anyway, so uh, they're actually the team that I'm going to be supporting this year. It's... Could, uh, did you mention... Um, oh, what's her name? I can't think... I can't think of her name now, but there's another midfielder I can't think. Play, plays for Reading, or used to. I don't know whether she's left Reading now or not. Um, I can't uh, Amalia Eklund? Yes. Her as well, obviously, yeah. in, in midfield. A good player, obviously. I know people are going to look at Reading and go, oh, well, they got relegated. Can't be that good. But another good player in there as well. Well, it wasn't but... her fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it was all down to her <laughs> that they got relegated. Um, but I mean, Phil, for yourself, obviously, we've got a lot of Vilda fans probably watching this and a lot of you know people that will watch this back that obviously are a fan of her. Where do you kind of see her fitting in? Because I mean, early in saying there, you know, I'd rather see Vilda than, than Engen start. I mean, based off last Euros, Engen for me was so disappointing. She was the one player I looked at and thought... Like her, her attitude wise and just ability, like everything was off last summer. And obviously, there was reasons for that we've just spoken about there. But, you know, Joe's saying, no matter of being obviously a starter and so on, do, do you agree with Jess a little bit that maybe Vilda's lack of game time for United maybe will cost us some more minutes in the World Cup? Do you see her starting? How do you kind of see her fitting into this squad? It's undoubtedly a factor, right? But again, you have to remember that there's really, really close contact between Hege Risa and these players, okay? And Hege has a way of communicating with them. She tells them, right? When they say to her, right, well, I want to go to this club. I want to go on loan. I, I, should I stay here and fight for my place, right? Hege is like, you know, the, the sort of the mother hen. And she says, okay, you know, the decision is yours. You're an adult woman now. You go, you do what you think you need to do, right? But this is what I want to see from you. Right. Uh, I've had conversations with players. Uh, Yuli Blackstar, Manchester City, just a couple of months ago, I was talking to her on the phone and I was asking her what Hege thought. And Hege said it was perfect for her to come and play for Beko Hecken here in Sweden for a little while and get game time. But Hege didn't mind her playing at Manchester City because you're playing in one of the top teams in England. You know, you're playing with Bunny Shaw every week. You're playing against great defenders every week. Right? There's loads of great players there. That so the training level there is higher than what it would be in the bottom half of the Dom Alsvenskan here in Sweden. Right. So from that perspective, Hege doesn't actually look maybe a game time. She looks at that as a factor, but not the deciding factor on whether or not a player is going to play. Right. And to be honest, I I know that there have been conversations between Vilda and Hege about what she should do, especially back in the last transfer window, what she should do in, the, in this transfer window in terms of salvaging her career. When Hege took over, I think actually Vilda was left out of a squad there, the first squad that she called and then was eventually called in when somebody else stepped out. So there's a very open dialogue there as to what can be done. If Hege took, she doesn't have any passengers in this squad, right? So if Vilda's in the squad, she is there to do a job, right? Hege has something in mind for her and she will be as well prepared as any other player in that squad. And to be honest, I think that there's a huge, huge opportunity for her in these games, right? She may not start. If they're going to play 4-4-2, I think that the, the central midfield is going to be Ingrid Susta Engen and it's going to be Frida Monum. Now, Erling made a comment there that he would rather see Vilde Borisa in the middle than Ingrid Susta Engen and there's a reason for that, right? Ingrid is in and out of the Barcelona squad, but in the same way, she's playing against Barcelona players every single day, right? So her level is up here. But if you watch the Euros last summer, uh, the problem really was that she would switch off on occasion, right? The communication wasn't really there between her and Frida Monum, and that's essential in a midfield pairing, right? You don't want to have to look to your right or to look to your left when you're looking for your midfield partner. You need to know where they are. There has to be this telekinesis thing going on, and that didn't work between Monum and Engen, and that meant that the ball was played through but, uh, the two of them and then all of a sudden it was Maria Torres daughter and an unfit Maram Yelda who had to deal with it and England destroyed them by doing that and that's how they got the ball out to the right to Beth Mead and that's how Yudi Blackstar was caught out and that's how they lost eight poxy nil right what Vilda can do there is she can do one or two things. She can go in and replace Ingrid Sustad Engen. If she plays the first 45 against, uh, New, uh, against New Zealand and is away with the fairies, Vilda Borisa can come in there, sit in there as a six, ping the ball around, not do anything right, but not do anything wrong either. And then that's her position for the rest of this tournament, right? All you got to do is show up sometimes and be in the right place and, and you can win just because somebody else has let their game slip just a little bit. Now, 
don't let it come across I, I, underestimating English Sears today, right? Tremendous footballer. But that little brittle converse, uh, co concentration that she has sometimes costs her. And we're at a level now here where this is not, you know, we're not playing in the, in the playground anymore. This is the real deal. And it doesn't matter if it's the Philippines or Switzerland or, or New Zealand. A good team will punish, will punish you if you take your eye off the ball, right? And let's just say that Engen comes out and plays like, you know, she's going to win the golden ball for the world's best midfielder. And second place in the voting is Freedom on him. There's still a huge role for Vilda Borisa in this, right? That's going to be to close out games because... The, I know it's winter down in the Southern Hemisphere now, but it's going to take a savage amount of e energy. Like if you play against New Zealand, they're home, right? They may not be very good, you know, but they're going to come out there and give their all. And you're going to have to match them and you're going to have to be better than them for all 90 minutes. That means that 65, 70 minutes in, that's another thing. The other thing is that say that Norway have qualified after two games. They have two victories, right? You have the Philippines coming up, I think, in the last game. What do you do? If you want freedom on and fresh for the opportunity of taking on Spain and maybe then the USA, right? You have have to rest those players. Norway didn't have the squad to do that in 2019 and that's what cost them. That and not having a left-footed left-back uh, cost them against England when they were knocked out in the quarterfinals on my birthday and no, I still haven't forgiven them for that, right? But that's what they need to do. They need a Vilda Boadisa in there and if you ask me, Connor, that's why she's in the squad, right? Hegerisa is not bringing along any passengers. She's going to ask Vilda to do things and it's going to be essential that Vilda gets in there and gets on the ball and, and play is as the Manchester United player that we know she can be, right? Whether it's as the 6, the 8, or the 10, go in there, control the tempo of the game, give the game what it asks you for, because let's face it, there's no guarantee that she's going to be at Manchester United at the end of this transfer window. I really, really hope she is. I really hope that she gives Mark Skinner a body of work now that says, you know what, you've got to get this girl in there. You have to find the space for this girl, because I've been saying that on this particular channel for a year and a half now, that this kid has has so much football in her, but you have to create the context to get it out of her. And so far, I think both Manchester United uh, over the last couple of seasons and Norway have failed a little bit on that front. So, I mean, you make so many, but I, I think this is, in, <laughs> I don't know what that was in for. I, 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 when I saw that comment, I thought, because obviously, Jess, I'm pretty sure you were a midfielder. So I thought that was in reference to, like, hang on, your time will come in terms of maybe Jet, you'll get into the Norway squad and like fill into midfield or something. Or, like, I, don't know. I can have some words. <laughs> you know, I've, I've actually retired now, but I might come out of retirement if, uh, you know, the World Cup came calling. I was halfway, to be honest, when Serena tipped me up when we started getting all these injuries to our players. I was thinking, like, you know, I've not actually got any plans this summer, to be honest. Um, so, you know, a few weeks away in Australia would do me, do me some good, you know. <laughs> Certainly will. I'll come to you, come back to you, actually, Jess, and obviously if you want to follow on to, to Phil as well. But in terms of... Talking about Vilda, obviously, you know, we all, know, we all all know about the game time argument and everything else. But if Vilda has a really good talk, let's say she does start, I'll just you know, obviously throw it over to yourself first. Can you what can you see from a United point of view that doing? Because if she does have a really good tournament, there's already clubs that are looking at her anyway, that are clearly interested that you know it's out there in public and some that aren't. But what do you reckon that does? Because that obviously gives Mark Skinner a bit of a headache, which is a good thing. But we yeah. obviously, we're not, we're, I think me and you have had this conversation when we're talking about midfield next season. We've got Lisa there as well. She's hardly featured yet because of her injury. We've got a lot of midfield and we're looking at more. <laughs> so it's yeah, I, like... think, uh, I think there's going to be, this summer is going to be kind of a bit of a, a tell, I think, with Vilda. Uh, I mean, it very much sounds kind of like that Hager is similar to Serena Wiegmann and how every player has a job, basically. Whether that job is literally just to be in the change rooms and boost morale, or whether your job is to go on and chip the keeper in a World Cup final. Um, like, every player has a job. And, you know, we saw for England how good substitutes could be and how they could kind of, like, prove their stock. So I don't see any reason why, even if Vilda doesn't start and if she's coming in off the bench, she really could kind of cause everyone some headaches, uh, opposition and kind of Mark Skinner back here at home alike. Um, because if she does have a good tournament, I'm, I'm sure she's going to want more game time. You know, the reality is any player is going to want to play football. Um, so if a kind of good tournament could be a good kind of bargaining chip for her to maybe come back and start asking questions of Skinner and the rest of the coaching team as to what she has to do to get, get more game time kind of in our domestic league here. I'll just follow up very quickly, Jess, throwing it back to you, actually. So she's actually, as we know, her option's been triggered for, for next year. Um, so she's got one year left on her contract. Obviously, you've played the game as well, Jess. But if you 
with Vilda in this situation. And then let's say she has a good tour and they get to the quarterfinal, semi-final, whatever it is. She's a big part of that. And she doesn't necessarily start the season for United. Would you be looking to leave or would you be looking to leave straight after the tournament? What would you, what would you do as a player in Vilda's situation? Because she clearly loves United and obviously I know Phil yeah. will be able to elaborate more on this, but she clearly loves being at United. She doesn't particularly want to leave, but she's not getting, I don't know, how old is Vilda now? She's got to be 27, 28. So she's yeah, getting towards the kind of her peak of her career. I think she's sort of my age. And the thing is, coming off the back of a, a tournament can kind of, it can send you either way. You can either kind of slump a little bit back at back at the club or you can kind of ride that high and start playing real, kind of a lot better domestically. So for me personally, I'd be wanting to come back and I'd be wanting some guarantee at least of more game time. Uh, maybe not starting every week. You know, I think you do have to be realistic, maybe manage your expectations. But I would certainly be asking questions and I would want kind of def- uh, sort of definitive answer of where my role is at club level. Um, and if I wasn't going to be getting the kind of amount of football that whatever I thought was how much I sort of wanted to play, if I wasn't getting that amount, I would be looking to leave because the reality is if she stays another season and kind of isn't happy with her game time, she's going to be leaving on a free at the end of next season anyway because she just won't sign a new contract. And I don't really think that's going to be beneficial for anyone. You know, It's not beneficial for her to sort of sit on the bench for more time than she's willing to give for the next year. And we're going to lose a good player on a free on a free again. Um, so it, it's a difficult one. You do have to sort of manage expectations. And I'm sure Vilda herself will, you know, not all players think that they can turn up and play 90 minutes. You know, they, that everyone's going to want to turn up and start every single game. But I think players themselves are going to kind of have realistic expectations of what they want from a club. Um, so I think as long as she, if she does have a good tournament, I think that puts her in a really good place to kind of go back to Skinner and be like, right, I've done this. This is my expectation for the season. Are you going to kind of give me that or not? And then go from there. It's certainly... Yeah, go ahead, Connor. No, I was just going to very quickly bring up this comment before I lose it. I can't believe Chris has counted every single green dot in the the background. Jesus, Jess, we bored poor Chris to tears. (laughs) I I told you my Monday was going badly today. (laughs) <laughs> I just thought I'd bring it up before I'd lose it. Sorry, Phil. Carry on. No, I was just going to say that there's a, like I'm not really sure uh, what how Max Skinner is as a person or as a coach, right? But I know that a lot of players in Vilda's position will go to a coach like that and say, okay, what do I need to do to be part of your plans, right? Do you see me as a substitute? Do you see me as... And I heard it said to one girl who was in an international squad until recently, she was told that she was the 24th player in a 23-person squad, which I thought was an awful thing to say to a professional footballer. But, you know, I mean, you can't ever imagine that player playing for that particular coach again either. But I do think that a player of her dignity, right? This is her second World Cup. She played at the Euros last year. She has won the league here in Sweden. She's played in the Champions League. She's come second in the, in the Women's Super League with, with Manchester United, right? This is not a player you can ignore. This is not some 17-year-old who's coming in, you know, with ideas above her station, right? She's a very, very talented, very promising international footballer. And I think it's only fair that Manchester United and that Mark Skinner say to her, look, this is how we see you. And then it's up to her. If they can tell her, right, okay, you need to be able to run X amount. Your recovery times need to be this. You know, your CO2 max needs to be that. You need to score X amount of goals. You need to do this, that, and the other. Give her things that she can develop. Give her things that she can do or let her go, right? Because, you know, as much as being a, sort of a Manchester United fan or a Norway fan, I'm a Vilda Boadisa fan, right? I'm a fan of every player. And it doesn't matter whether they're on my level or on Jess's level or on Vilda Boadisa's level. I want to see them get at a football what they are capable of. I want to see them maximise that. And I don't ever like to see anybody standing in the way of somebody like a Vilda Boadisa and say, no, I'm just not going to give you the, opp- the opportunity, right? Set them free. Let her go to Italy, as has been rumoured before. She would be absolutely brilliant brilliant in an Italian league that's just getting stronger. She'd be brilliant in Spain. Clubs would b- crawl over their own mother to get her here in Scandinavia, right? So if Manchester United is not the future, there may even be clubs, I mean, Brighton are throwing around money like snuff it away, as we say in Ireland, right? It could be down there that she goes as a replacement for Megan Connolly, you know? So, but let her do that, right? And we also seen that um, 
just because they executed the option for the extra year doesn't mean that they're actually going to keep her or that they're in any plans whatsoever. It's just that, you know, they might get a few quid for her. But I do think that there's an awful lot of clubs. It's not just Vilda. There's an awful lot of clubs have to be really, really honest with players now because this career is short, Connor. You mentioned it. This should be her prime, right? And no player should spend their prime sitting on a bench, right? Find your level. Go there. Achieve your thing. Do what you can. And then, you know, in five, six, seven years' time after the next World Cup or the next World Cup, say, that's me. I did the best I could. I got the opportunities I wanted and that's how I performed you know but the worst of it is and I know myself when I played football I always played at a level that was too high for me I wasn't good enough right so I ended up sitting on the bench and at the age of 52 I regret that now all the things I could have done I should have dropped down the divisions I should have done my thing down there now but I was too dumb to do that but at least nobody ever stood in my way anything that I did was my own fault but the idea of seeing somebody you know an international coach or club coach stand in the way of a player I don't like that idea and much and all is the be- almost the best thing about Vilda and Maria Thoris daughter is that they introduced me to this channel and I'm deeply, deeply grateful for that. But Lisa will still be there. But, you know, if she has to move on from Manchester United to achieve what she's capable of, then I'm afraid that has to happen. I was going to say, as a little bit of insight there, if Vilda Barisa was playing week in, week out or, or whatever, we probably wouldn't have met because it was because of Vilda not playing that sparked a conversation on the uh, on the men's team fan channel, which then brought you over here. <laughs> exactly. And then so- it was just a row over all these... <laughs> <laughs> and then, then a year were. and a half later I'm still sitting here saying the same things and talking about elephants <laughs> I was going to say yeah but now you're fully contracted now to he's not by the way that's a you know, <laughs> before anyone uh, um, Con- Con- Connor has an option on my next contract <laughs> yes we've uh, we've tied Phil down for another year we've, re- we've renewed the option we've triggered that uh, one year extension yeah. <laughs> yeah I expect to be on a Brighton fan channel by Wednesday <laughs> I was going to say, you're not wrong, though. They are seriously throwing some money around with the, sure some of the signs. Vicky Lassard at the end. I mean, that's ridiculous. Where are they getting this money from? That's, what I, that's, a, a, <laughs> that's, a, whole other, that's a whole other show right there. What are Brighton doing? <laughs> certainly is. Um, but no, I agree with both your points. I think I'm feeling, I, f- I feel for it because it's tough on the, the current United squad because I don't think... She, last season, I kind of... I, Obviously, was fighting that argument. I could see why she wasn't getting in because that team was winning week out, week in, week out. We were going for the title for the, you know, for one of the first times with FA Cup final for the first time. We were pushing, but the fact she seems to get no minutes at all. The only minutes really she got in the WSL was purely because of Zellum's suspension. She came in for that game. Um, obviously, we know the free kick she scored against Durham, my goal of the season. Um, so she, the quality's there. I just, I think it just bugs, I guess, United fans that maybe we don't see her more because it's not like she's not. <clears throat> starting but coming on around the, the 60 minute mark we hardly see it she comes on for five minutes maybe at the end of games and it's just like you said i'm a little bit if she's not going to play i think she's to be moved on because it's it's not fair on her as we said we obviously we'll get on to lisa in a second but we obviously got lisa there as well we're looking at another midfielder she's going to fall further down the pecking order than she already is because you know you don't spend 130 odd k on lisa like we did for her to sit on the bench either so i'd imagine lisa's you know next in line if anyone's going to start it's a tough one. It's a good headache to have, but at the same time, I feel like next season, with the more games that we're going to have, you've got to have some more uh, kind of rotation, I guess, uh, in there on that one. Um, I want to come back to a quick fire ones on, on Norway and the World Cup in just a second, but sticking with kind of our, our Norwegian players, um, Jess, just very quickly to you, I'll throw it to yourself, and obviously Phil follow it, following on. Obviously, the two players that have missed out on the squad, Maria and, and Lisa, Um I guess this is more a question really for Maria than Lisa because we know that Lisa's sticking around for next season. But what would you do with uh, Maria just out of interest? Obviously, we know that she's been out obviously with injury. She's recovering for that. United, it makes me think United are looking um, that she's staying for next season purely because United keep posting about it and she keeps posting about playing for United next season. So it makes me think that she is here for next year. Um, But what would you do obviously with those two? Obviously, as we mentioned, we've just spoken about Vilda. Lisa, we'd expect... At the moment, I think she starts in that midfield three that we've got. I don't know about you, but and obviously Maria as well. What would you do with with those moving into next season? I think Maria probably very similar to this season. Um, I was half kind of expecting her to maybe leave at the end of this year, but like I say, it doesn't seem like she kind of will now. Um, I see a lot on social media, us like as a club, United posting about her, her posting about her time at United. Obviously, it was unfortunate that she kind of got injured when she did. Um, but for me, I, I see her probably kind of as part of the team next season in a very similar sort of role to uh, where she was this year. So kind of in and out of the team a bit. Um, you know, you kind of brushed on it just slightly before that squad depth this year is going to be very important. Um, at the end of the day, if we want to keep pushing for the top spot and for kind of better spots, you know, champ, uh, finals, we've got the Champions League, 
we are going to need squad rotation. Um, I do think that this year we were very fortunate in terms of having a kind of lack of injuries. Um, but, you know, that's not always the case. I think in some ways that's what kind of led us to not make the changes that some of the other teams were making, that we, we were just very fortunate with the lack of injuries. But like I said, you can't guarantee that every year, so it's uh, kind of imperative to have the, the good rotation player. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see where Lisa kind of fits into fits into all that. Um, I do think she could kind of get, you know, some decent kind of game time this season. I think uh, the, the sort of early games in the season could be kind of time for her to shine a little bit, especially with some of the players maybe being a little bit fatigued off the back of the World Cup. Going into those early games, we might be sort of looking looking more at the at the players that weren't actually present in Australia over summer. Yeah, I mean, Phil, I'm going to ask you about kind of Maria and obviously what you think of Lisa as well. Because we, I don't think we've I think we've had you on the show since we signed her, but it was a what we I don't think we were talking about. You know, I think we were talking about the running at the time on the last time when you were on. But Maria, I've just had a quick look. So she was actually out of contract this summer, and she's got the option the same as Vilda, so it would have been triggered, I'd imagine, for for next year. What can you see happening with her? going into next season? Because I can't imagine she's going to play all that much, I've got to be honest, going into next season. Can you see a possibility where she just kind of sticks around as a squad player for, for next season, but moves on at the end of next summer or at the end of next season? How can you kind of see her, I guess, United career uh, going? I, I think when she got injured towards the end of last season there, I thought like that was a real sort of, it was a gut punch because you thought, okay, she has struggled so hard. She had that concussion at Chelsea that just she just couldn't shake, right? And then she's getting back in there and she's playing. Then she gets the Euros last year. And again, she was exposed. She was made to look foolish by the really, really poor defensive tactics of that Norwegian team. And I felt so sorry for her and Yuli Blackstad that night, you know, because she is a better player than that. You know, any player left on an island like that against world-class players like England have is going to be made to look foolish. And... You know, I've often said that I don't think that she got as much of a chance at United as, as she could have. I would have seen her as a, a very promising defensive midfielder there. She could have moved up and protected the United back four. This is before United became what they became last season. You could have put a player in there like her, well able to pass the ball, uh, well able to, to fight for the midfield, well able to set things up and to break forward and to, to control a counter-attack and that kind of thing. I th thought she would be very good in that role. I think now you're talking about almost like the Queen Mother, right? You know, if you bring her back, you you're coming off a World Cup season, right? Six United players there. That's got there's going to have to be rotation between the league and the Conti Cup and the FA Cup and the Champions League. You're going to need a lot of players, right? But you're also going to need that experience because one of the things that we forget about Maria is such a physically dominant player. You know, if she's up against a team that she can match, she's so physically dominant you don't even notice how good her positioning is and how good her decision making is, right? None of us gets any faster as we get older. And I would expect that position to become even clearer now, right? Louise Quinn does it for Ireland. She, she just has this sixth sense of what's going to happen, where the ball's going to go. And that's why she blocks with her backside and with her knee and with her head and all sorts of things. Maria's going to turn into that. She's going to develop and age into that kind of player. I think she has a crucial role to play. I do think that her head is going to be turned during this summer and towards next summer, by the likes of Bran in Ballion, right? They have a tremendous squad going on there. They won the league last year. They are one of those clubs that they bring through players, they sell them, they bring through new players. Um, you have players like, oh, the heck, my sister Andreen has gone back to Norway, that kind of thing. I think there's a, there's a job there, there's a role there for somebody like her. And then there's an opportunity then to move into coaching. We forget how intelligent she is because of her physical capacity and her physical ability. And she's actually very good at explaining the game as well. When you talk to Marie, about football she's very clever very clued in she knows exactly what's going wrong at any given time she can explain those things not all players can do that and it's often defenders and goalkeepers more so than attacking players who can understand these kinds of things so I think she would be a huge huge player to take that you know coming from that winning culture at Chelsea and to take that man to Manchester United was a great thing to begin with and now I think it's even more important because of the fact that United are going to have to raise their game even more next year because Nobody watching this is going to accept United finishing fifth next year, right? Nobody watching this is going to expect, accept United not getting into the group stages and doing well and putting in decent performances. And to do that, you need many things. You need young legs and you need fast players and you need exciting players, but you also need solid players. You need intelligent players. You need people who, again, John Amici, the great former British basketball player played in the NBA, he says hey, your culture is defined by the worst behavior that you tolerate. Having people like Maria around in a locker room puts the bar very, very high 
for how you behave as a professional footballer at Manchester United, right? She will do all the right things. She doesn't sneak out the back for a fag after training. She doesn't drink alcohol during the season. She doesn't do any of these things, right? There's nothing left to chance. She goes home, she rests, she watches Netflix, and she goes for walks with Theo to the dog, and that's about it, right? She's so dedicated to being well prepared for everything that she does, and you need players like that, especially because... Sometimes younger players will come to a club like United and they go, oh, I've made it. I play for Manchester United. I'm playing in the Champions League, right? And then you go and have a kebab and your career goes to shit, right? Because you have to learn, right? You have to learn how to do this. And there's so many great players like Maria and like Vilda and like all the Hegemai around. And their job is not just to play football, but it's to teach others how to play football as well. And if she were to leave at the beginning of, of next summer, you know, and go back to Norway or whatever, I think that would be a brilliant legacy that she has created a culture at Manchester United that says, this is what it takes to win. Do you want to do it or not? <laughs> that buzz was Maria texting one of you, wasn't it? <laughs> Going and watching the show. That was a great description. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned obviously Brown there as well. Obviously, is uh, not that one. It was Ali that I was bringing up. Obviously, Martin Ho has obviously gone over there as well now. So they've got a relationship. I can see a couple of United players going there, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, because of that relationship, just because obviously Martin knows the players and so on. I can see him taking Maria over there and I can see him taking a couple of United youngsters with him as well. Um, <clears throat> over that way. Um, I've got a couple of quick fire world Cup questions for you both because you weren't on the show last week, so I'm going to come back to that in a second. But Phil, just very quickly on, on Lisa, obviously, because we've not seen her really yet. We've saw her for a bit. Got injured after 25 minutes or <laughs> whatever it was, and we haven't seen her since. <laughs> but obviously, you've probably seen her a bit more than, than the rest of us. But I guess, what would you kind of say her, not, not how high is her ceiling, but what can United fans, I guess, expect for, for next season for her? Because I don't know. We paid a high fee for her, so I'm expecting her to be at least, you know, getting well a lot more minutes than we've seen other midfielders get. That's for sure. Do you know what? It's weird, Connor, because sometimes like that, it's like Yuli Blackstad, Manchester City. That was like a record fee for a Norwegian club when they brought her in from Rosenborg. I think she was playing for at the time, right? And there's two ways that this can go when you pay. Um, uh, uh, that's a very nice comment altogether from Sporty Mac Sportface there. Thank you very, very much indeed. I will do it for less than Gary Lineker, right? A quid less than Gary Lineker. But when you pay a big transfer fee for a player like that, right, it can go one or two ways. And it often happens very quickly. They either settle in immediately and they look brilliant. Or like Yuli, you'll find yourself on the outskirts of the squad and struggling to find out what you need to do to break into it. I think that Lisa is a very calm person. She's more freedom on them than Vildebor Lisa. And even at that, she's a little bit sort of calmer, not as high octane but an extremely high level of intelligence about how to play the game. And often in central midfield, it doesn't come down to, you know, you'll talk about a central midfielder's touch and their passing range, right? But for me, the absolute key characteristic in terms of central midfield, it's not even physicality, it's having the brains to understand what's happening around you, right? Because central midfield is the one place on the pitch where what's behind you is not a line, right? Behind the goalkeeper is the goal line. Behind the left winger is the left touch line. Behind the right winger, behind the, the striker is the other goal line, right? A midfielder has to have their head on a swivel, right? And not all of them manage to see the game in that 360 degree view, but Lisa does, right? And this is what they paid all that money for. And it's a gamble because what works really well at one level or in one league doesn't always translate to the women's super league where the tempo is high the physicality is high and that kind of thing i told you the story before about guru right on our first morning uh training with chelsea and millie bright came in and smashed her up in the air and as guru lay writhing on the ground millie went over to him and went Welcome to England, kid. And that was her introduction, right? And that often happens for Scandinavian players because they think, I've been watching this football all my life. I'm ready for this. And it doesn't matter how ready you are for it. It's like somebody setting your house on fire. Now you know what's going on, right? Now you know where the emergency is. But I do think that Lisa has that capacity. Whether she can reach it up with Manchester United or not, I would say absolutely. I would say she has the talent, but not least the mentality and the intelligence to make the most of this opportunity. Now, the only thing that can stop her there again is, I, you know, haven't seen it once bit and twice shy. When you see what's happened to Vilda there, I would hope that Manchester United have a way of communicating to her what they want from her, right? Not just you, can, you come in, you oh, you did okay, right? But to be able to coach her, and that's what coaching is. It's taking a player aside and saying, okay, this was right, this was wrong. You can be better at this. You need to think like this. You need to do this better. This is how we play the game, and that means that you have to use one touch rather than two, or it means you have to use five touches because the rest are fucking hopeless, and we'll just give the ball away, right? But you need to be very, very clear with players like Lisa and tell them what you want, because they can 
can deliver it, right? But without that guidance and without that coaching, there's the risk again that we wind up in a situation where she doesn't deliver on her full potential. And the worst of it is when a player like a Vilda or Elisa maybe goes to another club and then all of a sudden they bloom because they get it, right? And again, I don't want anybody to get the impression that I'm criticizing Mark Skinner at all because, like, you know, the guy just came second. Manchester United are in the Champions League. He's done an absolutely brilliant job. Nobody can question that. But what I would say is that the, the key to success is doing this thing consistently, right? What is the marginal gain here, right? It's not players you can bring in. It's getting even more out of the players that you have. And now they paid money for Lisa, but I really believe that she has a really, really high ceiling. And I believe that, you know, if there was, you know, three into two doesn't go for Norway, it's going to be four into two doesn't go when Lisa's back and fully fit and put it up to Monum and Ingen and Boa Lisa as well. It's, uh, yeah, I, I'm really intrigued next year. We're going to do plenty of shows on this. Obviously, obviously over the summer and close to the, to the start of the WSL, obviously, once we know what our midfield options are going to be, because I feel like, well, I don't feel like I know that there'll be some movement on midfield, certainly after the World Cup and when transfer start game into the swing of things. And who knows? We could have a completely new midfield going into next season. Oh, yeah, it's definitely going to be uh, very, very interesting, I think. And I think a lot could potentially change off the back of the World Cup. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it, to be honest. I think, uh, yeah, there could be some changes. Certainly, I don't know. I don't. Know. People don't like change. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, we'll but that's the, that's the thing, though, Connor. Because like you can't go into next season and do what they did last season, right? That's absolutely out of the question, right? They really have to do. You know, there was a time when you two played on New Year's Eve in 1989 after releasing one of their albums, and Bono was so delighted he went, "Okay, now we just have to go and dream this up again." And that's the challenge for Mark Skinner and for Manchester United right now, because what they did last year, eating bread is soon forgotten, right? And every team knows what they did now. Every team saw those players, some of whom have left the club, some of whom will be in different positions, some of whom will be a year older, some of whom may have even won the World Cup with England now. You know, so things are going to change. That dynamic is going to change. And that's where, you know, the day after the season ended, I'd say he was out with his notepad going, okay, how can I dream this up again? And that's, you know, the great benefit for players then is that, you know, everything, everything's back to square one. There is a chance for Vildebo, Lisa. There's a chance for Lisa Nolson. There's a chance for all these players. Maria Torres thought to reinvent herself as a defensive midfielder, as a right back as a towering center back in that Lee, Louise Quinn mold, you know, and that's actually fascinating. As Jess says, to be able to look forward to that and then add new parts into the mix and that kind of thing, in one way, it's the most exciting part of the season. We haven't even kicked off yet, it's month, months away. I was gonna say, do yourself fixtures on tomorrow, though. So, uh, I mean, I think there was somebody did ask us, are we going to talk about it? Probably not because there's not much to talk about until we know what the fixtures are. However, I really want Arsenal at home on the first game of the season because <laughs> uh, I'd love to see uh, Alessio Russo back at Ellis. Can you imagine that? What's and as Char that? Charlie repeatedly says on air for Letizia, just to absolutely body her out of the way. <laughs> um, I'd love to see, uh, love to see that. I mean, or, or Chelsea actually, because Chelsea are shocking on the first game of the season, and we need to that's beat them. <laughs> so <laughs> they, got, they lost the last two opening days, didn't they? That's what I mean. So yeah. we've got <laughs> if we get a player, maybe the first game of the season is a chance to get over that mental uh, mental block. So um, we might do a show on this, but we're, we're expecting a transfer announcement this week. So it's going to be a show on that when, when that comes out anyway. Um, right, obviously, sticking with the World Cup, before we wrap this one up, there are a couple of quick fire ones. I asked the guys on the line, S1, um, this time last week, actually, a couple of these ones. Um, so which, which one should I start with? I'll start with the Golden Boot. Who you think is going to get that uh, in this tournament? Uh, obviously, there's a few. I can't remember who came up last week. Sam Kerr was mentioned. Kelly was mentioned. James... Pop. I reckon maybe like pop for me, pop. Th that's a good shout. I would yeah. say this is the thing. Like I remember seeing uh, Germany in the in the Algarve Cup. Uh, just before the pandemic broke out. Actually, the pandemic sort of stopped them playing the final. Italy got to the final that year. And uh, I remember looking at Germany and going, and I've been looking at Germany for a long, long time. I was going, they have 50 players they could bring to the World Cup. And as long as they have pop there, they're, they're going to be there in the semifinals anyway. So that's a good shout. I do think, though, I don't know if you remember Kathy Freeman winning, was it the 400 metres or the 200 metres at the Sydney Olympics back in the day? And it was a classic. Uh, Kathy was an Aboriginal woman who did, won for Australia in Sydney. And it was one of the most emotional things I've ever seen. And I do think that Sam Kerr is going to do something like that. I do think that there's going to be something. She's such a big game player. And she's such, oh, a, yeah. such a proud Australian that I really do expect her, you know, if it's Australia and Ireland to go through, which I think it will be from that group, I do expect uh, Sam Kerr to net a good few goals. You know, she might tear Nigeria apart rather than Ireland, hopefully. But uh, Sam Kerr or Pop definitely are, are two very, very good shouts. 
I was going to say, I was kind of the way we kind of did it last week. We were looking at who's got an easier, who can stat pad in the group games against the teams that are maybe not as highly ranked and can rack Actually, up four yeah, or five jo- goals in those kind of games. Jo- Joe has a great tip there in Barbara Banda. I watched her playing for Zambia against Ireland and then she scored a, a whole bunch of goals against uh, Germany as well. They got the winner uh, with 10 minutes of stoppage time or something like that. <laughs> an, an incredibly direct player, like the, the kind of player that if you if you have a counter attacking team and you go, okay, Barbara Banda's up top, okay, because you can literally put the ball anywhere in the opposite part of the field and she's going to go and get it and not only that but she has the technique to finish as well her finishes are absolutely brilliant it's worth watching as soon as the goalkeeper starts to leave their goal line and close the distance she hits it and that's you know anybody who's played up front will know that the earlier you can catch the goalkeeper with just one foot on the ground the more chance you have of that going in so if you watch Barbara Banda you're going to see a good few goals like that hopefully for Zambia and uh, that well I don't think she's going to have enough games though you know Kara is likely to be in uh, the tournament longer and Pop is definitely going to be in the tournament longer and it's those extra goals that you get in maybe a quarter final or semi final that's going to tip you into the golden boot discussion there. I, th- I think that's why I went pop because looking at Germany's group, obviously, you've got the Mor- Morocco, Colombia, and Korea. I can see them getting a, obviously a couple of goals there, obviously, in the German side. I, you know, I wouldn't rule out somebody in the Norway squad, obviously, with the group they've got, if they can rack up a couple of goals against New Zealand or, or the Philippines or so on, if they can obviously get into the quarterfinals as well and get a couple of goals. I wouldn't potentially. Uh, I don't know. There's a few shouts. I definitely think pop is probably the safe. Safe bet. Sam Kerr is another one. I think is a is a safe bet. Obviously, any USA striker, <laughs> I would uh, would say is a is a safe bet as well because I'd expect them to get pretty far as well. Um, so, only I don't want to see a single Sam Kerr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. United fans have been haunted uh, haunted by that one. Um, you know, actually, potentially we're, we're we're after a couple of strikers as it is. Um, so we'll see see where United put our money after the World Cup. That's for sure on that one. Um, we kind of covered this a little bit earlier on, but kind of dark horse for the tournament. So I don't. Last week there was a lot of names mentioned. That I don't feel were necessarily dark horses. So a team that maybe you don't think is being spoken about that you feel could maybe overachieve at this tournament. I'm going to be be true to my character and say Norway because I think most people would have written them off after last year and completely right to do so. I think the Sweden are being mentioned and I think if Sweden can sort of adjust a couple of things, right? They've been trying desperately to get Caroline Sager from FC Rosengård. They're, they're, like, they're pinning all our hopes on her and Caroline hasn't been fit for months, right? But they have something. I don't know what it is about them. that they, you know Olivia Skogel comes off the bench. She's actually Caroline Sager's partner. Fantastic footballer. And um, when Ireland and Sweden were drawn in the group, uh, the World Cup qualifying group, uh, on the same day, I sent a, t- a text message and went, oh, that's that's fantastic. It's been great knowing you all these years, but we cannot be friends anymore, you know? And then she came on and she had the assist when uh, Ireland drew 1-1 with them in Gothenburg. So Ireland took the lead and then she had the, the assist and I still haven't forgiven her for that, you know? But I do think the Sweden have something there. There's two things they need to sort out. One is how they're going to do without Karlin Sager and the other is the goalkeeper question. So you have Zatino Musevic from Chelsea and then you have Jennifer Falk from Bia Bia and here in Sweden and they need to decide who their best team is and get stuck in there Nigeria as Jennifer says there there's a lot of people in Africa that I've spoken to are talking up Nigeria right this as I say the most successful team men or women in African history serious serious footballers but you have that thing of they're forever fighting with the football association about conditions they're fighting about bonuses all these things you know players saying oh we might go on strike there's a lot of strife in the back room there if they can put all those things to one side Nigeria have a tremendous football team there and not just offensively but defensively as well we have this idea we always thought oh you know African teams aren't that organized that's just nonsense Nigeria fantastically well coached team there and I think one of the teams that should have been favorites and then weren't favorites but now might be dark horses again are probably France France were a huge disappointment four years ago at home and they were really highly strung like there was things in that camp that just weren't working out they were far too focused on what people thought about them as a huge disappointment for them to come out as early as they did but with uh, Helve in there now I, I really think that they could they could do things because having seen how they played against Ireland they have speed and they have skill and when you put those two things together and the way they combined for their second goal against Ireland no team is stopping that Germany aren't stopping that the Americans aren't stopping that Canada aren't stopping that if they can play football like that and reproduce that kind of thing they're going to shock a few people and I think they're probably they're probably there thereabouts people would say that they could win it but I think the people need to take them a little bit more seriously yeah I mean just take your pick there's so many names in the comments there's so many names that Phil just mentioned there or what so, who, who are you kind uh, of looking at Originally, I was going to say France. Um, I think whilst everyone's all, always kind of known that they've got quality players, they've kind of they've always underachieved the tournaments. 
Um, you know, people have hyped them up year on year and they've never really performed like they should. You know, maybe now things will come out about kind of what's going on behind behind closed doors. That might explain a little bit more about why they've under- underachieved. Um, but for me, France were kind of the original team that I was thinking for Dark Horse. However, I think Phil's convinced me on Norway, to be honest. Um, genuinely, um, I so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go Norway in my dark horse. I think you're right. You know, again, similar to France, they but even more so, they really did underperform um, last year. You know, everyone was shocked at that, um, and I don't think that's really a true representation of them, and that's not how they wanted to kind of represent themselves so i think not only do they actually have a really good team but they're a really good team with something to prove this year more than kind of anyone else basically so yeah for me yeah uh, for me it's norway the dark horses i reckon this year, uh, this year. see i was gonna say them but i said them last summer and i don't want to jinx it again so <laughs> i'm gonna go with somebody else. i mean that's a cracking comment we'll just put in there <laughs> yeah uh, i mean yeah <laughs> um Harsh, Portugal was a good shout. What Joe was saying, obviously Zambia or Portugal. So I'm looking at Portugal. Obviously they're in the group with USA. Obviously Vietnam and Netherlands. I'm not overly sold on the Dutch either. So I I feel like Portugal could get out of that group. You know, obviously in second, they're not going to come first and meet the USA. But I feel that there's a chance that they could get through that group. So I I put them as as potentially up there as a dark horse. Obviously played well against England in the in the obviously the most recent game for INS pre behind closed doors game obviously down uh, in Australia but I can, I don't know there's a chance for them obviously Zamba's the other one obviously mainly because obviously that Germany uh, three all um, before the before they jet, jetted down as well but yeah I mean what about Canada are they dark horses though or are they expected to go far I think that's maybe the difference I think they're probably expected aren't they more than uh, yeah. more than anything else I mean, they're the reigning Olympic champions, and I think they expect to go far. I was talking to Harji Johal, who's a tremendous Canadian journalist. I've known her for years, just before she flew yesterday. And she was saying that, you know, she believes a lot in this team. Like, you know, they're, they're so solid. But the problem, again, for Canada is where the goals are going to come from, you know? And the thing about international football is you, you need two things, right? You need a simple game plan that every player in the squad can apply, and you need individual skill and talent, right? And that needs to be throughout... The, the, the whole team, right? So that means forwards who can score, if they just get one chance at the game, they can put it away. Midfielders who can control the game no matter who they're playing against and defenders who are just solid no matter what. Now, Canada will tell you that they're the reigning Olympic champions, right? But they really should have had the Swedes, the Swedish team present them with their gold medals, right? Because the Swedes threw that away in normal time. And the fact that they let it go through extra time and the fact that they let it go through penalties. And I was one of the few people in the stadium in Tokyo that night when they lost that game. And I have never seen devastation like it. You couldn't even talk to the Swedish players afterwards because they were in floods of tears. And they know, and I think Canada know as well. You know, now Canada, don't get me wrong, really, really good team. Probably deserve the label of dark horses, but I think they believe that they're even above that as well. You know, I think that they think as reigning Olympic champions that they're going in there with their chest puffed out like a guy going into a nightclub kind of thing, you know. And they think that they really are there among. Uh, oh yeah, Beth Priestman, of course. Ellie making the point: a brilliant manager, fantastic motivator, really organised, and she really understands that idea of getting a team with you know simple principles. Like, oh, okay, this is what we're going to do. You know, uh, whether they have the individual skill up front, right? They have it everywhere else, but whether they have the individual skill up front to, to score goals when it counts that's the only thing i'm doubting if they can score every chance they get absolutely they'll go all the way to the final but i do think that the swedes had their number that the swedes kind of closed them down a, a little bit and then the only other minus is that christine sinclair is one of the best players that i've ever seen but she's far too close to my age to be effective at this level of <laughs> sorry you'll apologize for my uh laughing um so jess is having some te- jess is having some technical difficulties and the uh as a the, the, the back and forth crap. messaging of, of panic <laughs> going, going on. my phone's about to die now and i can't find a charger i've got this table but i can't plug it into anything <laughs> so i it's, do you know what i think i've just got to accept at this point if i vanish i vanish <laughs> we'll just we'll just need to accept it tonight that tonight much like canada panic. <laughs> yeah, basically, just like Canada, things are not going my way. What do you look for a charger, Jess? Um, or if you're able to find a plug or something like that? Um, I wasn't going to ask this one, but Jennifer's asked a question here. Tournament flops, I guess. Who do you think 
maybe well, obviously Norway, I guess, would fall into that category from the Euros. Um, who would you say well, that you don't think? I mean, Jennifer's got for a big shout there at USA. I feel will fall over. I mean, that's a, if they go out early, that's going to be a shock. Um, but who do you feel and uh, say in France? I mean, I'm gonna, I, 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 I have one that nobody else has thought of and nobody else is going to say, and that's FIFA, right? Um, <laughs> I reckon that they are just going to, you, you know, that meme that you see where the guy's cycling along and then he does something and he sticks the fork in his own or the stick in his own spokes and then falls over and blames somebody else. That's going to be FIFA after this World Cup, right? Because this is the biggest tournament there's ever been, right? I think there's two things. One is that 32 nations, I think, is too much, right? I really didn't enjoy Thailand getting beaten 13 0 or whatever last time I played the USA because that's difficult. Yeah, Vic is in there with VAR as well, which is also a FIFA thing, you know? But I, I do think that, you know, they, they seem to be scoring a series of own goals. I was talking to an agent yesterday morning and I was talking to her again today, right? That there is rules around this tournament which means that players can't post things on their own social media promoting products that aren't sponsors or partners of the world cup which i think is just disastrously bad because these women earn so little money i mean there's i i earn more money than a lot of guys are going to be playing this world cup would do and that's that's absolutely appalling these are the best footballers in the world right and and now you're going to come along and say no no you can't have your own sponsors you can't do an ad on your instagram story for a protein shake or something like that. That's just nonsensical. And this need to, to keep it clean and everything else like that. I understand how modern marketing works, but there has to be a line drawn somewhere. This game has to be about the players. It's not about me, and it's not about all for United and the newspapers we write for and the radio shows we talk about. It's about the players. It's about their dreams, and it's about them going up against one another. They are by far the most important people there, right? We should have had 26 players in each squad. Right? We shouldn't have a Jamie Finn going down there as a training player in the Irish squad and not entitled to anything. She can't even say she's a World Cup player. She's basically along in the same way that you know the guy looking after the kit is. Right? That's that's not what this World Cup should be about. This World Cup should be about lifting up all these women on the field, about giving them the best possible opportunity to do this and allowing them to lie in their pockets handsomely if they can because they deserve it. They've done the work to get us here. Right? I would like to see slightly less teams and slightly greater opportunities for the players who do make it because it's about them at the end of the day therefore fifa you can always say plus they didn't give me a job there this year right now <laughs> <laughs> which is an absolute travesty as well considering the work that you have done uh, in, in previous tournaments and so on and how you've spoken earlier as well but no 100 you know joe's up backing up there as well uh fifa was the, the 26 player squad thing is just ridiculous i think everyone said that we've seen injuries i mean i mean i said it in a in a group chat obviously phil that you're in as well that those friendlies that were on the other day why so close to a tournament, having friendlies, you know, five, six days out. And obviously we're seeing injuries now. Obviously France had a, had a big one, obviously at the Ireland game. That's a whole conversation. And it's, uh, but what an absolute, I don't, I don't know, it baffles me. It really does. And why the 26 player squad thing isn't a thing just amazes me as well. Because it's just, I think Phil, you said it in, in one of our chats, it's just poor planning and preparation for what you, you know, I think I tweeted it the other day. We're going into, you know, three, four days out from what the biggest tournament you know, in the world. And uh, all we're talking about is injuries and, you know, player squad sizes and all those kinds of things when we're not, we should be, obviously we've done it on here. We've spoken about the, the players and the teams that are competing, but that's what should be the conversation. Instead, it was the injuries and it's everything else that's, that's around it and that shouldn't be the case. Well, it, the last time um, a Cork midfielder almost missed or missed a World Cup and it was a huge scandal in Ireland was when Roy Keane walked out of Saipan, the training camp at Saipan in 2002, right? And the interesting thing, we, we sort of liken that to Denise O'Sullivan almost getting injured because she's another key midfielder from the, the city of Cork in Ireland, right? But what we tend to forget is that Roy Keane walked away from that tournament because Ireland were training on a surface that was like a bloody car park and they didn't have the right materials, cones, vests, balls, all those things. He was speaking from a player well welfare perspective right over 20 years later we're still having the same conversation around why there isn't 26 players in the squad and why we're playing behind closed doors friendlies right so somebody leaked the footage of that tackle on Denise O'Sullivan with no sound it came from one of those you know those coaching cameras that you see that are mm -hmm. up on a big tripod and they just follow the game these AI cameras right and people go oh that wasn't a tough tackle for the first shut up you don't know how that felt you know when uh, Denise was tackled fairly low on the shin and the longer down the shin you get the weaker it gets right so it's actually quite a dangerous thing to do there's also a ligament there that's very very sensitive it doesn't often get damaged but when it's done it takes a long time to come back from but the point of the matter is we should be playing internal games then we shouldn't be playing 
against other teams who are battling for their places where we don't control all the variables, right? So Vera Pau in that situation or Wiegmann or whoever else, you know, Jerhardsson for Sweden can control absolutely everything and he can say to him, look, if you slide in two-footed on somebody, I'm going to put you on that plane home, right? That's the kind of thing. And again, it gets back to the point that I made that this is about the players. It's about providing them with a platform to shine, right? Let's say their careers are, are hanging on a thread here, right? And, and like a serious injury for Megan Campbell. Megan's out of, um, she's out of contract, right? Sorry, Megan Connolly. She's out of contract right now. She walked away from Brighton. Her contract wasn't renewed, right? She's in the shop window. And as of right now, she's unemployed, right? She is not the only one in the Irish squad. And she's not the only one at this World Cup is in that situation, right? We have a duty of care as football fans and football administrators and football lovers to these women to make sure that they're taken care of in the best way possible. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, what tends to happen at FIFA is the commercial needs of the organization get put first, right? Keeping the sponsors happy and the broadcasters happy almost always seems to go ahead of the players. And we need to stop that. And we can do that because... The women's game and the men's game are not the same thing. They're coming from completely different situations. And we can say to them, look, you know, either like, don't send the players at all. Don't send the team at all. If you're not going to provide a situation whereby they can thrive and they can give the best account of themselves, then it's just not worth doing it. And I do think that, you know, fans in particular need to be very loud about that when we talk about ACL injuries to players, when we talk about the size of squads and games and the international calendar, because it's only going to get bigger because FIFA wants more and more international games. And there was already a lot of international games on the women's side. And we need to control that because girls need to be able to recover to perform at their best. No, 100%. That's been a, a, a topic of conversation about the whole season about these international friendlies. That, I mean, I'm pretty sure that there is an international friendly on the week of the start of the WSL, which is absolutely mental to me why we're playing games three or four days before the start of the WSL season, just after a World Cup tournament it's as well. Necessary. Like, no one needs mental. it, no one wants it. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's there to suit no one but kind of like the sponsors and the kind of corporate organisations and the actual football embodies, basically. There's no player protection, you know, they're not interested in that player welfare. It is literally all about kind of like uh, looking good to kind of corporate, potential corporate sponsors and getting more money, essentially. It's basically, that's all it comes down to, money. Well, I think in the beginning, Jess, when women's football was smaller, right? The Women's Super League is not the biggest league in the world, right? So when you only have, you know, 20, 20 something league games every year in various leagues in Europe, right? There was a need back in the day for oh, more absolutely. international matches. Yeah. But, but we're not there anymore. We have a Champions League. We have the Conti Cup. We have the FA Cup. And that's just in England, right? There's loads of games to be played. So, you know, you really need to look at the load that's on the players now. And I'm sorry, the other place we're falling behind is in the science of it, right? Because if you look look at periodization and Raymond van der Heyen's theories and all this kind of thing, right? Recovery for men and women is not the same. And we need to start investing in these things and saying, okay, how does this load that we talk about, and we're talking about player load an awful lot in the professional game these days, how does it affect the female body, right? Not the body, right? Let's study these things in depth. Let's study the physical load. Let's study these ACL things and take the money that, you know, you might have spent on, on putting together these training camps or these international friendlies and invest it into those things. Because until we understand better what we're doing here we're, it's like it's like playing russian roulette with the oh, future these it days. get me started on how they sort of think <laughs> can i just point out that i've just retired right and they just started bringing out women's football boots like i did that tonight this season like they've just released women's football boots meanwhile i've been playing in like lads boots for what like 20 years honestly i'm absolutely fuming about the whole situation to be honest <laughs> i really am in fairness I, I could have played in me flip flops and I still wouldn't have been any better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, mate, to be fair, football was not my uh, my first ball, I can't be honest. Um, Jess, actually, I don't think we got your answer. Who's your, could you were finding your charger or whatever, or your plug or whatever you were doing, your kind of flop of the tournament, who you think is. Uh, um, well, a... currently myself for just being technology <laughs> failing me tonight, to be honest, but I, will, I have managed to get my phone charging, I think. So hopefully I won't disappear. Um, to be honest, I'm, I don't really want to say it, but England. There was a lot of England shouts, to be fair. Like, uh, I just, we did so well in the Euros, but injuries have just, injuries have just hit us. And I think the, I think the pre there's a lot of pressure now. I, I don't feel like there was pressure before, but kind of come off the back of the Euros, did so, so, so well. Everyone's kind of looking at us now. We're down as sort of like favourites to win. Then you look at kind of the squad in comparison. Don't get me wrong, we've still got a really good squad. But we've had some kind of B 
big upsets. Um, you know, we're going into the tournament. Millie Bright isn't even kind of fully fit. That's our captain um, who's replacing the actual captain who kind of very, very late on in the season got injured. Um, part of ACL FC over there at Arsenal. Um, so, you know, there's been some huge hits. Our player of the tournament, our um, Golden Boot winner, Beth Mead, obviously been been kind of out. It did seem like it was maybe a little bit of a race against time where I think a lot of people were holding out hope that she'd maybe make it back in time. But I don't think it was ever realistically likely. Uh, but like I said, there's a lot of kind of unknowns maybe this year going in, going into the competition. So for me, I think uh, I think England, unfortunately, which really does break my heart to say because I hyped them up so much last year and I enjoyed the ride so much. But I will say that I do hope that I'm very disappointed and I hope that we actually come away winning it, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a few shots. I'm, I'm going to say this and I'm so sorry, Alina, if you do end up watching this back, but I'm going to say Sweden from the start because I don't think that... I know I can feel the message I'm going to get if she watches this back. <laughs> It's a good um, thing you said that after an hour and a half, mate. Otherwise, you'd never have listened to the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like Sweden. I just don't think they get spoken about a lot going into every tournament. Obviously, they've got some good players in there, but I don't think they, they'll live up to the kind of. I don't think they've got a lot of expectation, but I just don't think they're going to do anything of any quality in this tournament. I might be proved wrong. It's the whole thing with these things. England's another good shout. And I mentioned Netherlands earlier. I don't think there is. They've got some good players, obviously, in there. But again, I don't feel they're as strong as maybe they have been in previous years. And, uh, you know, because of the history and because of what they've, you know, done in, in international tournaments and so on recently, I feel like people look at them and go, yep, yeah, they'll go far. But I, 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 can't, I can't see them going far either. So, yeah, one of those three, I think, for, for me on, on that one. And, yeah, I apologise, Alina, if you're still watching this. <laughs> but... So the final one then, obviously, it's your uh, predicted winner who you think is going to go on to win the whole tournament. There's a, there's a lot here that could... Uh, there's a few... Na- I've got three and I've stuck by it since the start. And it, one of those three for me is a team that has not been mentioned throughout this whole hour and a half, which is amazing because we've pretty much spoken about every single team in the tournament. It was a Haiti, is it? <laughs> no, one of mine was Brazil. Oh, I, was I feel like Brazil... Was- I've got a good chance of winning it. They're on a good side of the draw, I believe, with the side that they're on. Got some um, good players so, as well. Really good players. Just, yeah, we need to keep saying that in case we get one of them <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the summer. We've we've got our eyes on a couple of them, so we need to <laughs> need to make sure. It's, yeah. it's not a bad shout as a as a dark horse. I, I still think that you know, like too many of Brazil's really key players are you know they're almost too experienced now. I mean, Marta is playing. You know, she's played in every World Cup since 1958 for the men and the women. You know, so it's like, well, what a tremendous player. She's my absolute hero in women's football. The best player I've ever seen by a mile. But uh, I think that it's hard to look away until somebody tells me different. And by that I mean Norway beating them in the quarterfinals. I think you can't look beyond the USA. I just think. They, you know, they have really understood the game of women's football and they've developed it so well, both in terms of their domestic league and everything they do around it. And again, if the Germans have 50 players that they could bring in and still be brilliant, I think that you know the US probably has 100. They've just got so many good players. And even their worst player is so much better than, than any player in any other team. It's just like, it's so annoying because I really don't want them to win it. I think that the greatest thing that happened in the Euros last year was a new winner in England coming out uh, and really sort of putting it up to these other European teams. I think we're seeing Spain mentioned there. Great shout as well. It would be tremendous for Spain or in Italy or, or Sweden, for that matter, who've never won a major tournament, never won the final of a major tournament, always the bridesmaids, never the brides. And it would be brilliant to see a team like that win it. But that's the problem with international football. As I say, a great game plan and the most skillful players is usually going to be enough for you to win it. You know, And they, the, the Americans can do that for seven, eight, nine, ten games in a row if they have to. Yeah, the only thing that pains me more than saying that I think England are going to be the biggest pop is that I think that USA are going to win. Um, and I don't want to talk about it anymore, to be honest, because I just I hate the USA for no reason other than the fact that they're just really good and it's just dead annoying, to be honest. <laughs> so we're all agreed. If, Once the quarterfinals are over, we're not watching the rest of the Yeah, I'm not, right? I'm not interested. If, if it's <laughs> if saying someone other than England, even if it's England, I don't think I could bear to watch it. Um, yeah. the USA just they just knock me sick. I just I don't need their stupid positivity when it comes to sport. I just <laughs> I just don't want I don't it. know, Jess. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Pat. 
I just know I, I, I can't the thought of them actually winning just oh it it, it get it gets to me it really does it affects me deeply yeah I, especially as it's been announced today that they're obviously making a Netflix documentary of this whole, oh, whole World God. Cup journey and so on so uh, we get to see it in in four 4k high definition uh, I shall add that to my won't be watching list <laughs> for the autumn <laughs> yeah so, my other two teams, obviously, yeah, I mentioned obviously Brazil. The other one was USA, and the other one for me is Germany. I just, I just never write Germany out in any international tournament because no. they just always show up. I know a lot of people looked at that game, um, the three all before the tournament. I just think, just never write them out, never write them off in any tournament. They've, mm. they've got more than enough quality, and they've got one of the best players in the world in Oberdorf midfield. So, yeah, I wouldn't write them off either. But who knows? Maybe no, maybe somebody else completely. Did. Maybe Sweden win it, and I'll just get a. Piece. <laughs> imagine a situation in like, in like four or five weeks time where we're sitting there going go on Germany go on are we really ready for that as a, as a, as a nation as, as as European people I think we are <laughs> well it, it's very likely it's going to be Germany England in the quarters it should should both teams top their group and obviously make it through to the quarters it'll be England Germany in that quarter final so repeat the Euros final be quite uh, that's going quite to be nice. a big one that um and yeah, with with Pop, obviously this time around, obviously missed the Euros final last year. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah nobody likes the US chance, and we'll, we'll leave them to it. If they win it, nobody's going to be watching it apart from the US <laughs> US fan. We got a lot of US viewers though, so I have to be kind of semi nice. Great yeah, people, sorry, everything great I just, people. About the yeah. USA, I didn't mean you guys in that. I just meant oh, the national team just. And I only say it because they are too good. It's not fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're just they're so, like it's like when they send our basketball team like the, the dream team yeah. to the olympics in 1992 it was like okay okay fair enough you know but, <laughs> but they are that good all right yeah it's, uh, certainly it's gonna be an interesting tournament i'll see uh, well look to wrap it up there because we're going for an hour and a half i thought i had a feeling this would be quite a quite a long one um while everyone is still watching we'll be doing world cup shows obviously now uh, you know, and now it's three days away. So starting next Monday, um, we'll have kind of World Cup weekly uh, shows where we kind of talk about the games of the previous days and the weeks and so on. Um, we'll obviously have England match reactions to the first one obviously being on Saturday, which I can imagine there's going to be a lot of goals to talk about. So isn't it England Haiti on Saturday, which obviously is the open. I can see a lot of goals coming in that one. So obviously we're back on Saturday for that. We're expecting a United signing this week. I think everyone knows who it is north of the border up in Scotland. So once they've played their game tomorrow, we'll expect to get that one over the line. So we've got some shows ready for that to go out as well um so yeah plenty going on the, the content doesn't stop uh, we don't get it we don't get a break over here <laughs> on the on this channel that is that is for sure um phil where can people are you doing anything for the world cup obviously you said that you're not going going out there but where can, if people want to follow you and things like that i'll see i'm sure there'll be some good stuff on your twitter that's for sure over there do you know what i'll if, be doing for, for the world cup, world cup mostly i'll be sulking over on twitter right at philip o'connor with one l you'll find me over there and one of the things i probably will do connor now i'm not trying to sort of impinge on your business idea here but i will probably do some twitter spaces especially after the ireland games right so as soon as ireland australia is over on thursday uh hit me up on twitter and i'm going to do a space on that and i might have a couple of guests lined up as well now i've spoken to one or two people that we can uh, we can get a hold of and that i might bring on some of the lovely people from all few united if they want to come in and, and have a little chat as well and we'll try to tell you not just what happened in those games but also why it happened and then needless to say when norway go out there and you know beat everybody all around them and that kind of thing we'll have a look at that as well so uh, yeah follow at philip o'connor on twitter and uh, thank you very much joe for your kind comments this evening and in general and uh, as i say it's always a pleasure and i would say to those of you who are viewing this right if you know anybody out there from Ireland, from England, who hasn't heard of this channel, like get them roped in here, right? This is the time to do it because the best thing about All for United is this community that I've been lucky enough to be part of by taking part in these broadcasts. And these things only get better the more people that are in them. So uh, rope a few of your mates in here as well and we'll have a great summer talking about this World Cup and indeed Manchester United towards the beginning of the season. No, for sure. You're always absolutely fantastic to have on. You know, I can echo everyone in the comments on that one. Hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks. I'm really hoping... It's not been it's not been done for about, nearly about a year now. Where me, you, and Alina are on it on the same show. Oh my god! Is the universe football. ready for this? <laughs> I'm really hoping in a couple of weeks when she's back from Australia, we can get that one sorted. And because uh, there's no no better time to obviously be talking about the World Cup. So hopefully in a few weeks' time we can get that. The the, the Scandinavian that. simping episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, we, we, Jeff, you might be on that one as well. We might need a moderator to calm us down a little. 
God. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll mentally prepare myself for that one then. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully in a couple of weeks. But every Monday, obviously, we'll be back doing doing those shows. Obviously, make sure you're liking the video and subscribing all of that jazz. Make sure you're following the Twitter account if you can find it. If Elon's not ruined it even more, um, at all for United WFC and obviously the Instagram, the TikTok, it's all the same at as well. But for now, we shall see you guys in the next one. Thank <laughs> you.